My name is Jordan Cram. I'm the CEO of Instoa, and we're going to talk about decisions. Decisions are so important. A good decision, the, the difference between a good decision and a bad or a mediocre decision is massive. It's material. Uh, for an organization, up against competitive and market forces, those good decisions can result in outcomes like, in the case of Apple, the largest corporation in the world, or a humdrum organization that made some bad decisions like RIM or BlackBerry. For a project, the aggregate sum of decisions results in a positive outcome that satisfies the broad set of stakeholders and those that do not. For individuals, you all manage teams of people, you lead teams of people, the decisions you make impact their careers and impact their livelihood. So decisions really matter, and today, we're going to talk about decisions, and more specifically, how the brain works with data, how it uses data to either support or unconsciously to undermine the very decisions we make using that data platform. So um, let's start with an example. And I want to go back 16 or 17 centuries and talk about a guy named Valens. Now, he's not you know, the most famous Roman emperor. He's kind of a mediocre emperor. He's certainly no Augustus. Um, and in the late fourth century, he was overseeing a Roman Empire that looked something like that, where the East and the West had already start to divide, and he was faced with a very difficult challenge, or we would say a very difficult decision. The uh, ancient tribes of Germany, the Goths, were up against the uh, border of the Roman Empire. They were forced there through the migration of the Huns who were coming in from the east and coming down from the north, more fierce, more savage, more warlike than the Goths themselves. And the Goths asked Valens, please, can we cross the river and just settle peacefully inside of your empire? Now, Valens was indecisive. He was getting counsel from all sorts of directions. And in the end, he said, oh, OK, fine, yes, uh, on the condition that you don't bring any weapons across the river, and by the way, we're going to take all your children and we're going to scatter them throughout the entire empire so that you don't pose a threat. So that was a bad decision, and that bad decision was followed up by poor execution of that bad decision. The Goths came across the river. Um, they, the administrators from the Roman side forgot to enforce the uh, leave your weapons behind. And then administering the refugee camps, they extorted them. They treated them horribly. Um, there was starvation, hunger, pestilence. The Goths revolted. Um, and you do not want an angry mob of Goths with nothing left to do but fight inside your nation. Long story short, um, 35 years later, they sacked Rome, and the lights went out on the western half of the empire. The east languished on uh, for another 10 centuries. So we're talking about decisions. Now, none of us in this room are going to make decisions that impact the fate of empires. But we make very important decisions, and we make many, 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 many of them each hour. So let's talk about um, examples from the last century. Ross Perot, poor guy, he passed on Microsoft for 40 or $60 million. Excite, for less than a $1 million, could have owned Google. Coke launched a product that is in the history books for one of the worst strategies ever, um, completely misjudging their uh, consumer tastes. Now, you all are bombarded with literally millions of pieces of information. Your brain can't process millions of pieces of information. So we sit there kind of perplexed. What do I do? You do know that the decisions you take, and you have to take them in a timely manner, have significant impact. Researchers tell us that there are about 11 million pieces of information floating in and around us. They also tell us that our brains can process about 40 of those bits of information. 
So what does it do? You know, our brains are very efficient and effective organs. They create patterns. The brain creates shortcuts. It uses past, past knowledge, and it makes assumptions. So while this makes for a very efficient uh, organism, or, or organ, uh, it can be deceiving to us. So whereas we, we feel as though we are rational, we're ethical, we're unbiased, that we make sound decisions. Again, researchers tell us, look in the mirror, we all fall woefully short of our self-inflated perception. I want to use just a couple of examples. And, and illusions are a really easy way to do this. Um, as I prepared for this speech, I got caught and I looked at like 100 illusions. I came back to the two tables. So are these equal size or are they different size? If we take a sketch of the long, narrow table and we pivot that around and we turn it and we lay it on top of the other table, it's exactly the same size. But our brains, again, they're working with patterns. They're working with associations. It tells us, oh, that one's that one's long and narrow, and this one's square, when in fact they're, they're actually the same table. It's just positioned differently. Um, is that moving for anybody? And is that moving for anybody? OK, these are, I swear, these are static JPEGs. I had to look at the file type many, many times. JPEGs have no animation. But what's occurring is our brain sees a, uh, colors next to each other in a certain pattern, and it just assumes there's motion, but there's not. So these illusions are just kind of fun, simple ways for us to understand uh, how it is that our brains are working. And, and colors are also a really good example. We can actually recognize many, millions of colors. We can recognize them, we can see them, but what our brain does is it puts them into best fit versions. It takes, you know, the hundred spectrums of blue that might be out there, and it associates a coarse label, just calls it blue. Oh, Jordan, what color is that? Oh, it's blue, and in my mind it's blue, but that blue is very different than the blue in your mind. So it makes our memories biased, but again, pretty useful. And the brain is kind of adjusting between speed and accuracy. Uh, I ran a, uh, I kind of wanted to really drill in and see what are some of my own biases. Uh, and I chose a test that was put together by Project Implicit. You can Google that, and they've got a dozen or so of these tests that you can run. Uh, they've been put together over the last 10 years by a team of academic researchers. I chose the one that would be very timely and, and uh, in the news these days about career and gender. What it does is it just gives you a little small square, and on one side it might say male or female, and it just prompts you with the word. Paul, Margaret, Peter. And it just keeps running through these and basically what it's doing is saying, what are you responding to most quickly? And then it switches and it puts family, career, and it would prompt you with you know, children, salary, et cetera, et cetera. The results for me um, put me in this association, slight association with female in career and male in family. So it meant that I'm a, uh, an outlier. I'm in this 4% group. I asked my colleague, Carrie Foley, can you please run it? And Carrie was right in the middle of that 32% moderate block. So, you know, this is just an insight into how she's thinking about things, how I'm thinking about things. Now, Carrie and I would take dozens of decisions a day, and these biases matter. So, let's get back to data and effective decision making. Let's say you have a data system or you do not have a data system. 
if we are in this box, that means that you have functions in your organization that are disconnected or they're in silos. You have old, outdated processes. You may or may not have a software system. Nothing's communicating. And your organization may look a bit more like tribes that don't all or always get along. That's on the data side. On the def effective decision side, if it's low, their biases are strongly in operation. Leadership is not clear about the rewards of good decisions or the consequences of bad decisions. Um, data is used to kind of explain away anomalies. If we move over this direction, which is now a positive step, we have high value team members that have the ability to make effective decisions, but without the data platform, it degrades. So there's kind of always a constant movement from the right to the left. There may be turnover also as a result of that box. Here, organizations may have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars into creating these data platforms. They've connected their functions, they've modernized their processes, but it's a, again, if you sit in that box, there's a continual decay. You know, it'd be like a building that you constructed for $30 million, and each year in maintenance it costs you $6 million. And the value proposition just doesn't stick. But we all want to end up in this box, which is the state of continuous improvement. What we have found in order to get there is you have to meet at that point. And the timing that you meet at that point is very important. If we unroll that two by two, um, we can see how it all comes together. <clears throat> so what started this line of thought for us? Um, I was working with a business partner of ours, uh, Anna Marie Michaud, over here from CLG, and asked her some questions. Do dashboards work? Now, we're, a, we're the leading systems integrator for capital projects and facilities. We have been implementing systems, creating data platforms for eight and a half years. I was in a meeting with a client of ours, the uh, head of facilities finance at uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. He had just come out of a meeting with his project manager using one of our dashboards. And he said, Jordan, they don't see the red or the green indicators. There was a red indicator, clearly said your finance or your cash flow forecast is off, fix it. They didn't see it. So I was really disillusioned. I left that meeting and started asking myself, do dashboards work? How is it that it did not achieve that outcome? The data's accurate, it's timely, it's well represented, people have been trained, it didn't work. And so we started asking other questions. Uh, it wasn't enough to pull together good information, well represented visually, training people on how you could use it. The uh, traffic light indicators were failing. They weren't achieving the expected results. Um, the, the directional arrows of that you're trending worse or you're trending uh, better, again, uh, were not a fail safe. They didn't guarantee that a better decision was going to be made. We began to appreciate the importance of the, the decision-making biases or having effective decisions, of understanding what the unintended consequences or the unexpected outcomes were and the bias for inaction, that there's a pressure to avoid you know, what could be a career-ending decision if it turns out to be wrong and that politics is real, that it can inhibit clear and authentic and accurate communication. The dashboard may say go, it may say stop, but the individual still can't decide. So we have to get the data there, but we also have to get the people there. We have to get the people comfortable and able to make those effective decisions. So shareholders, or sorry, stakeholders need to be aligned on what the dashboards say, what the information says. Everyone needs to buy into that it represents the common interests. And then the bad news is put on the data. And we put that data to work 
in making an effective or creating an effective decision environment. So the question is, can you solve this? The answer is yes, you can solve it, and we'd like to walk you through how. <clears throat> Let me just kind of close up in the next minute or so about the facilities and construction industry and an example there, something that I'm personally extremely passionate about, is that our industry is massive. McKinsey estimates that the infrastructure investment in capital by 2030 will be $13 trillion annually. PwC's estimate is a little bit more conservative, $9 trillion in 2025. We are talking about huge, huge amounts of capital that have significant economic and social impact. And yet, when we look at construction's productivity, it's flat or in a state of slight decline relative to under in other industries. And this is, is a comparison by McKinsey uh, versus the manufacturing industry. If you go back even further, we see that this is not a new trend, but for several decades, construction productivity has been flat or in a state of decline. Now, there is some good news recently. Um, I got this post that 37,000 construction jobs were added in March. What would be great is that 37,000 productive jobs are added in construction. We need to up productivity. And decisions, and effective decisions, I would submit to you, is the most material and influential increase that we can have in our own productivity. The cost of a ineffective or the cost of a bad decision is really, really high. Um, and that we can lift productivity through effective decision making and using uh, the value of data that it can provide. Thank you. Thank you.